welcome and thank you for joining us. This is the first in a series of sponsored Lessons Learned webinars. Our goal is to provide a forum to share wisdom and experience between 911 communications professionals. My name is Don Shirey and I'm the trainer here at Higher Ground. On December 26, 2015, the community of Rowlett, Texas was struck by a major natural disaster when nine tornadoes touched down in Rowlett and neighboring communities just east of Dallas. Joining me today to talk to us about the recovery efforts and lessons learned from this incident is Beth English. Beth is the Communications Director for the Rowlett Police Department. Beth is responsible for the overall operation of the 911 Center for the city of Rowlett, Texas. She's a passion for 911 and the communications profession that is really unparalleled in the industry. Beth has been a loyal communication electronics customer for nearly 10 years, and she's a power user and advocate of Higher Ground's Capture 911, and has even brought Higher Ground recording systems on board at three of the PSAPs she's worked at. Hello, Beth. Hey, Don. Listen, thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to your presentation. Oh, certainly. I'm glad to be here and happy to be able to share what I've learned with my colleagues out there. So let me start by saying that a natural disaster like this one really puts you through the paces. Um, and when you finally stop to catch your breath and figure out what the heck happened, you need a great resource to help you evaluate what you did well and what you can improve. Um, Higher Ground was my resource after last year's tornadoes because we want to respond better next time. We've gone back through the recording to evaluate our communications and review our disaster plan and look for ways to improve um, in our day-to-day -day readiness. With uh, Higher Ground's incident recreation tool, we've discovered many of the lessons that I'm going to share with y'all today. Um, let me begin by telling you a little bit about the city. Rowlett is a bedroom community of about 58,000 near Dallas, Texas, covering a 20 square mile area on Lake Ray Hubbard. We have a team of 14 telecommunicators and we respond to calls for police, fire, and EMS for the city of Rowlett and also mutual aid for Dallas County and four neighboring cities. So let's talk about the night after Christmas last year and let me share, you with, share with you our new Christmas story that I wrote. It was the night after Christmas, the lights were still on, people were shopping before the good deals were gone, when all of a sudden there arose such a clatter and before you knew it, the sales didn't matter. The trees were all gone, cars turned on their top, the streets were all blocked by lines going pop. Now, I could go on for a few more stanzas, but you get the gist of it. Uh, last year on the night after Christmas, I was working my fun job at Brighton Collectibles uh, at a nearby mall and we weren't even expecting weather. The weather service had been watching some storms, but they were west of it. At some point, a thunderstorm brewed up to the south and started moving this way, but before it actually got to us, it split and part of it went straight into Dallas and the other part came east towards us. It still wasn't a concern. Um, and there were no warnings issued until the part of the storm that was coming our way picked up speed and a tornado touched down just west of Rowlett. At that point, the, the two people that had been actually watching the weather had less than five minutes to warn the city. Uh, at Brighton, where I was, we had noticed that the wind was picking up outside, but we really didn't think anything about it because, after all, it's the day after Christmas. Technically, it's winter. So a little wind didn't really mean anything, but then the outdoor warning sirens started going off. Shortly after that, I started receiving texts from the police department saying that we had cars flipped over, the phones were down, electrical lines were down, and we had houses blown away. The first casualties from this were on the highway south of Rowlett where vehicles had actually been blown off the overpass onto other vehicles on the highway below. We have two major highways that run through Rowlett, which is I-30 and the President George Bush Turnpike. 
the, one of the first calls that we got was about um, when the tornado touched down just west of that intersection of those two highways. And it had picked up all the vehicles on the overpass and thrown them down on top of the cars that were traveling on the highway below. There were eight fatalities in that one incident, uh, one of whom was a dispatcher at another agency in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I'll tell y'all, no matter what you plan for or what you've practiced for, real life just doesn't have the courtesy of doing things the way you've practiced it. When you're planning for the disaster, whatever that is, you think of all the things you're going to need to do when it happens. But until you've actually experienced it, you can't imagine all the other little details that escape you during planning. And so I'm going to go over a few of the, the details that I learned during the Christmas tornado. Um, but before I do, I think we should take a quick survey. Don? OK, thanks, Beth. We'd like to know, have you ever had any personal experience with a natural disaster in your tenure on the job? You can answer yes, and it went relatively smoothly. Yes, and we experienced a lot of missteps. No, but the organization I worked for in the past has. No, neither I nor my organization has, thankfully. So please select the appropriate response, and then click Submit. So it looks like about 50% of you have responded. So those of you who have not yet responded, go ahead and submit your responses now, and we'll close the poll in just a few moments. OK, so we're going to close the poll. And it looks like the majority of you responded as no, neither I nor my organization has, thankfully, 48% of you. So Beth, let's start with the phone and radio issues. Uh, some of these are little things, but they ended up having big consequences. OK. Thank you, Don. Um, our first major problem was with one of those very small details of the phone system. You know, one of the ones that are so minor, you don't think it's something you need to practice. We had recently switched to a new IP phone system, and we were operating as a remote off of a host. Now, when the tornado initially hit, we lost connection to the host network for about seven seconds, which kept the dispatchers on duty from being able to answer the phone. Now, seven seconds doesn't seem to be a major thing in the whole scheme of things, except that the two dispatchers on duty at the time didn't remember to check the network connection when they couldn't answer the phone, so they didn't know what to do. When I arrived less than 10 minutes later, I logged into the system which reestablished the connection to the network, and everyone was able to answer the phones immediately after that. So one of the lessons is don't forget those very small details in your training. Next, you want to make sure that all of your equipment can do what it's designed to do. Since the phones were ringing nonstop, we had people at the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, to help take calls. What we didn't know at the time was that the phones in the EOC were programmed to take overflow calls only, rather than being programmed to answer any incoming call. Because of this, those that were answering the phones at the EOC had to wait until the line had rung several times in communication before it would roll over to them to answer it. So this delayed calls being answered as quickly as possible. Of course, at this point, we're not worried about meeting standards. We just needed to answer the call. Another small but critical detail is to make sure your most commonly used transfer numbers are easily accessible. At the EOC, the phones had been programmed with transfer numbers, but the most commonly used numbers were in the list and not necessarily visible on the front screen where they could be found quickly. So um, also the evacuation books that had been created for each position had a list of the phone numbers to the various surrounding agencies, but those were in alphabetical order. So again, the most commonly used numbers actually had to be found in the list. We also discovered that most employees didn't remember how to use the backup phones to do anything other than answer the phone. No one had actually tried to transfer a call since shortly after we had installed the phone. 
So a few calls had to be relayed to other agencies rather than being transferred from the actual handset. All of these problems have been corrected since then, and regular testing of these procedures is ongoing. But we learned that it's really important to send regular email reminders about those little things and just to keep those items fresh in everyone's mind. In the hours after the tornado struck, it felt like we were getting a fire hose of phone calls and radio calls spraying over the call center. First responders were um, giving us a lot of information coming in from the disaster area. They were giving us addresses that had been hit, streets that were closed, wires that were down, and other critical information. So of course, the calls from the citizens were incredibly heavy as well, but because we had a reliable recording system in place, uh, we didn't have to worry about losing any of the detail. Uh, we were able to quickly find and play back the calls and the radio traffic to document and relay the correct information. Because the tornado hit the southeast and the northeast quadrants of the city, we still had half the city that hadn't been hit and many that were completely unaware of the damage that had occurred. So in addition to all the tornado-related calls that were coming in, we were also receiving and dispatching regular calls to the whole western portion of the city. Now, after the tornado had gone through and police and fire realized how much damage had been done, they immediately started search and rescue operations. And they were talking to each other and relaying neighborhoods hit, the roads closed, live electrical wires down on the main channel. So what we ended up with were clogged channels that we couldn't actually dispatch calls on. Our lesson here was that we should have separated the radio traffic immediately and kept search and rescue on our secondary channels in order to free up our dispatch channels for actually dispatching units. That leads us to the next category of lessons learned regarding communication, or lack thereof, between the EOC command and communication. And I know what y'all are thinking. Communications never has a communication problem, but we did. Um, first, let's take another quick break for another poll. Don, you still there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Beth. So we'd like to know now how you think volunteers from other agencies were notified to respond. You can select mass notification, radio, text, or none of the above. Please select the appropriate response and then click Submit. And again, those of you who have not yet responded, go ahead and submit your responses now and we'll close the poll in a few moments. So we're closing the poll and it looks like the majority of you responded with mass notification. What do you think about that assumption, Beth? Well, believe it or not, the answer is none of the above. Amazingly, volunteers began responding as soon as they heard about the tornadoes on the news. Very shortly after the tornado had gone through, we started receiving calls from citizens, police officers, firefighters, and public works employees from other cities wanting to volunteer to help. This was something that we had not anticipated and it was completely unexpected. And because it was unexpected, there was no plan in place to coordinate the volunteers. So we had no information to give them initially. Once we realized that so many were wanting to volunteer and because people were showing up in the damaged neighborhoods to help, Locations were set up for the sworn and firefighter volunteers to report to, and another location was set up for civilian volunteers and public works volunteers. Unfortunately, during the course of recovery efforts, the command center where the sworn volunteers were reporting was moved twice, and the communication center wasn't notified. So as a result, we had volunteers who were angry with us because we were directing them to the wrong place. I even had one officer from another agency chew me out on the phone because he kept getting redirected to different locations. 
he called us back just to tell me he had had enough and he was going home. So another issue, another communication issue, was between the communication center and the EOC. Because I only had two people on duty when the tornado hit, I responded to the PD to assist them with what I knew would be extremely heavy phone and radio traffic. And the chiefs responded to the EOC. Now, the police chief, who was coordinating patrol operations, directing resources and volunteers to locations and other agencies to intersections, didn't pass any information to the communication center because he was completely focused on the operations in the field. So when the command center moved or other changes were made, communications was not notified. It ended up becoming a case of the right hand not knowing what the left hand was doing. We also had a couple of issues regarding mass notification. At some point, very shortly after the tornado, we were asked to send out a mass notification to bring in extra personnel. And it sounded like a great idea. Hey, let's get some more people in here to help. Unfortunately, the phone traffic was so heavy, we couldn't get an outside line to do a notification. And no one had time to log in to send it online. It ended up being a moot point in the end because everyone who was not already working came in as soon as they could anyway. Thank goodness for helpful, engaged employees. Another communication issue came up in the days following the tornado. There was a massive effort for removing what ended up being 186,000 cubic yards of debris um, that was blocking traffic or causing a hazard um, in the affected neighborhoods. So in order to remove all of this debris, we obviously had to close some streets to allow the heavy equipment in to move the heavy loads. The uh, decision was made by the powers that be not to do a mass notification to the citizens in the neighborhood where the streets were going to be closed for debris removal. The thinking was that since the homes had been destroyed, there really wouldn't be anybody there to receive the notification. This lack of communication made the citizens angry and caused more needless problems. So we learned firsthand not to second guess any communications efforts with the general public. Another issue that we didn't anticipate was the welfare checks. Because so many citizens were on vacation and out of town, we only had one fatality other than the ones on the highway. Um, but those who were out of town on vacation learned about the tornado either on the news or from other people, other relatives, friends, calling them and telling them, hey, we had a tornado. And so they immediately started calling us, wanting us to go out and check on their brother, sister, grandparent, neighbor's uncle, you name it. And a lot of them wanted us to check on their houses. Um, they, they called and said, we're out of town on vacation, but we heard you had a tornado. Could you go check on our house? Well, we already had units going from street to street and house to house checking the affected areas. So we weren't actually going to be able to dispatch someone to the locations that the callers were giving us. Um, eventually, we were going to get to each location. We just couldn't dispatch anyone there. But since we're in the business of helping people, we initially tried to do that before we just became overwhelmed with the call load. So a lesson that we learned here was to tell those who were calling in on the welfare checks that they would need to give us a couple of days to check on everyone, and if they still hadn't heard from their loved ones, to call us back. And it, it sounds heartless, but that was one of the lessons that we had to learn because we were just overwhelmed. We also had just some other lessons that, um, that were somewhere anticipated, some were not. And these may or may not be issues in your center, but you definitely want to check these out. Once word of the tornado got out and we had the volunteers responding from numerous agencies. Um, now that was one of the most incredible parts of the whole event 
We never sent word out that we needed help. We didn't have to. We had responders showing up from all over the Dallas Metroplex. Um, in total, we ended up with personnel from 47 agencies that responded to our aid, and not all of them were in our mutual aid agreement. Now, because we had so many extra personnel on the street, every single radio in our possession was put to use, including the backup portables in communication. We never knew who took them because we were too busy and too focused on processing the call, but our two portables never came back to us. Now, that lesson's already been tested since the tornado when um, a lieutenant came in and tried to take our portables to use for an event. By the time my head spinned, finished spinning 360 degrees, he had changed his mind and decided that he was going to find portables elsewhere. So we have temporarily lost connection uh, with Beth, and she'll join us back in just a moment. So everyone, until Beth returns and is reconnected, I'm, I'm just going to kind of continue to relate to you her experiences. So uh, as she was saying, is, is often the case with IT-related equipment, um, they had put in some new equipment, they had upgraded some other pieces, and they even discarded even more. And the only problem was that the EOC communications room had become the dumping ground for all things old. So even though they had installed new hardware, uh, a lot of that old hardware was left in the room cluttering up the space. And in addition to that, they had cases of water, old telephone books, an old ACU 1000 radio control unit, and other really useless things that were only good for taking up space. And that made it almost impossible for anyone to get into the room, much less handle an emergency the size of a tornado. So another problem was their CAD licenses in the EOC. They had become, uh, or they had computers rather, set up with the previous CAD system on them, but licenses had never been purchased for the new CAD system. So the only way that they had of relaying calls from the EOC to the communication center was to actually call it in. And so by the time it took to do that, they might as well really have been dispatching by, well, carrier pigeon, really. CAD licenses had not been considered a priority until they needed them, you know, but by then it was too late. And they were stuck doing things the old-fashioned way, cell phone to cell phone. So if you experience resistance from the powers that be in spending money on something that won't be used every day, be sure to remind them of the fact that nature is not really going to care whether or not they save that money. Thank you, Don. You're very welcome. Glad to have you back. OK, so carrying on, because it's what I do, um, after the tornadoes hit, uh, affecting 1,145 homes and businesses, the volunteers came out in droves. And some of them helped residents sift through debris, looking for belongings and family treasures, while others worked on getting resources to those who were left without homes and or belongings, and those who couldn't leave their homes for whatever reason. Many of these people wanted us to tell them where they could go to deliver food, water, blankets, and other necessities, and we just didn't have that information. Eventually, we were able to assign someone to handle those requests, but it would have been much easier if we had anticipated the response and had it in our emergency plan for someone from the city to be assigned as a resource coordinator. But you can't plan for what you don't anticipate. In addition to the volunteers came the looters. You can always count on the looters to show up in a disaster. In order to combat the looters, a bunch of citizens got together and they formed their own little group called the Looter Booters. And their mission was to patrol all the damaged areas and to report any looters they came across. But we also started receiving calls from them reporting members of their group being attacked or harassed by the looters. So we ended up having to appoint someone to be their point of contact 
to coordinate their patrol times and locations, and then also to school them on things to do and things not to do. When you're scrambling to rescue people after a disaster, it's easy to forget about the animals. One thing you need to know is that you don't forget about the animals. Unfortunately, that was not something that we had thought of. When the tornado hit, so many animals were displaced. Some were actually carried to other parts of the city by the tornado, and then others just took off running, scared away from their homes by the storm. We hadn't made any provisions for the animal shelter to be opened in the event of a disaster. And we were just getting numerous calls from citizens who were either looking for their pets or who had found animals wandering around lost and wet and afraid. In our case, we have a group called Friends of Rowlett Animals, which is a nonprofit group that works solely um, on behalf of animals needing help or adoption. So after the tornado, Volunteers from that group came out and they worked tirelessly in documenting all of the animals that were lost or found and distributing that information to citizens who were looking for their pets. They created a Facebook page just for reuniting pets and their owners. And it took, it took quite a bit of time, but I believe most of the animals were reunited with their owners. And the ones whose owners couldn't be found were adopted. So although it seems like such a small thing to worry about in the wake of a disaster, many people were more worried about their pets than anything. And I don't know how it is everywhere else, but here in Rowlett, if a person gets hurt, that's, that's sad. If an animal gets hurt, you better be prepared to answer to it. So it would behoove you to make sure that you have provisions for the animals in your emergency plan. Another issue that wasn't anticipated was the need to have extra personnel and volunteers on hand for weeks after the disaster. Once the major portion of the tornado search and rescue was completed and cleanup efforts had begun, the EOC was shut down and operations moved to a command center that had been set up at the PD. Those who were left in charge of assigning officers from other agencies set up the command post in the training room here at the PD, which was upstairs from our communications center. Access to the elevator here is only allowed by key card, which for 16 hours a day had to be managed by communications personnel. So every time someone from another agency came in to take their shift, someone would have to leave communications to give them access to the elevator. In our new and updated emergency plan, this will be addressed and, trust me, a much better solution will be determined. Now, we're getting close to the end of the presentation, so let's do one last survey. How about it, Don? Okay, thanks, Beth. So we'd like to know, have you ever lost recordings or other data when your systems were somehow compromised? You can respond, yes, and we never retrieved them, yes, and we eventually retrieved them, or no. So please select the appropriate response and click Submit. So we've received about half of your uh, responses. Those of you who have not yet responded, please go ahead and submit your responses, and we'll close the poll. And just a couple of moments. Okay, so we're going to close the poll, and it looks like 90% submitted a no response. Does that surprise you, Beth? Um, it kind of does, just because of uh, Murphy's Law. It's, you know, the, the more that you need something, the less chance it's going to be there. So, um, and I've definitely had experiences where that has happened. So. With that, let's talk about some of the actions that we had to take after the critical disaster response period had passed. Because the affected areas were declared a disaster and expenses to the city were going to be astronomical, all efforts were taken to ensure that at least a portion of the cleanup and rebuild expenses could be reimbursed by FEMA. In order to do that, 
someone was assigned specifically to collect the needed paperwork from everyone who worked for any portion of the tornado or post-tornado operations, and also to ensure that the paperwork was completed as instructed. This included documentation of all employees and all hours worked related to the tornado, including personnel from other agencies who worked alongside our employees during and after the initial emergency. Also, all expenses were documented for anything that was paid for tornado cleanup or reconstruction. Now, as part of this data collection, we were required to provide copies of all 911 calls and radio traffic during the first 30 hours after the tornado hit. Needless to say, that was going to be a lot of data. So I'll admit I was scared as I approached this because I was not sure what I was going to find because we'd been on generators during some portion of those 30 hours. And like I said, you know how Murphy's Law is. I wasn't sure that we would have any recordings to send. So I got to say I was surprised to find that none of the recordings were missing. But with 1,203 calls to copy for FEMA, I was a bit intimidated. Now, throughout my career, um, I've worked with commercial electronics to install higher grounds recording solutions in three different 911 centers. So I've come to rely on their support team, and I'm on a first name basis with all of them. So I knew there had to be an easy way to export all of these calls, which came out to 14 gigs. And that was after I separated out the screen captures. So I knew if there was an easy way to do it that my commercial electronics tech would know how to do it. And so I called him and he just guided me through the process and I was able to select the phone call with control A and save. And that was the easiest thing I had to do after the tornado. So that was the highlight, I think, of my post-tornado action. Um, because thanks to our higher ground recording system, uh, pulling and exporting the recordings was the one thing that was quick and easy and didn't give me any grief. So after a community experiences a natural disaster of this size, it's critical to go back and, you know, like in the old days, review the tape. You never know when the next hurricane, fire, flood is going to hit your town, and you want to make sure that you're always improving your response. So you want to make sure that they are going to be ready to handle the next disaster that comes in. Personally, I love my higher ground screen capture when I'm reviewing the actions that my staff took during the call. Um, the screen capture actually allows me to see exactly what they were doing on their computer screen, which helps me figure out where some of the missteps might have been. Um, I also use the screen capture and incident recreation to figure out what went really, really right. Now, our police chief relied on these records to find out which of our first responders deserve special uh, recognition or commendation for outstanding heroic acts, uh, such as our one officer um, whose vehicle was completely destroyed by the tornado. And we didn't know that, so we actually sent her on a call of a woman who had gone into labor from the stress of the tornado. The officer didn't tell us that her vehicle was destroyed. What she did is she just took off running and ran as far as she could until she could commandeer a vehicle, drove as far as she could, then had to get out and run some more. And between running and commandeering vehicles, um, she ended up commandeering four vehicles and running about halfway to get to the scene of the woman in labor. Beth, thanks so much for that fascinating presentation. Your insight is is absolutely invaluable, as I'm sure our attendees will agree. So we're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. So Beth, our first question is, uh, did you need to service your recording system at all during the disaster or follow-up? We did not. Um, our system never stopped recording, and it hasn't stopped since, thank goodness. Wow. 
what a relief, huh? Yeah. Well, why why were you concerned really that your recordings might not have been captured? Um, because I've been in situations before higher ground when I desperately needed a recording to be there and it wasn't. So we have another question. Why did FEMA need copies of your phone calls and radio traffic? It was um, another um, another form of documentation um, of what other agencies responded and who all was there. How can we help Rowlett recover? Um, we still have several fam families who've not completely recovered from their losses. So right now we have a group that is collecting uh, for Christmas items to distribute to those who lost everything. Was there, I have, have one other and one last question to, to ask, was there any damage to the, to the um, radio infrastructure or cell towers serving the PSAP? There was not. Um, we are on the west side of Rowlett, and so we were on the side that, that didn't get hit at all, thank goodness. Well, again, thank you so much, Beth, and everyone really who has attended today's webinar. Lessons learned from the Rowlett tornado disaster. If you have any other questions, please contact Commercial Electronics or Higher Ground. So on behalf of Commercial Electronics and Higher Ground, thank you for joining us today, and have a wonderful rest of your day.